as long as the recording starts, we can start. People is gathering, but there is no problem. It's so, already started. It, yes, okay. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce you, uh, Professor Maurizio Porfiri, uh, for this plenary talk. Uh, Professor Porfiri is an institute professor at NYU, at uh, the Tandon School of Engineering. Uh, institute professor in the NYU is the NYU title for distinguished professor. And he is author of more than 300 journal publications and was the recipient of the National Science Career Award. Uh, he has also been included in the Brilliant 10 uh, list of uh, most promising and most popular young scientists in 2010, uh, with <coughs> major outlets on CNN, uh, NPR, Scientific American and Discovery Channel for his uh, discoveries. Uh, now, I am really proud that he is a friend of mine. He has been my mentor at NYU when I was there in 2010, and I'm really, really honored of uh, giving him the floor for his uh, uh, plenary speech. Please, Maurizio. Grazie. Thank you very much, Giacomo. So it's a pleasure being here. It would, be, it would have been better in Viterbo, but this is what we have. We're going to try to do the best we can. So now, present. Giacomo. Yes, yes, we wait some seconds, just some seconds for the sharing of the screen. We are seeing the, the first slide. It's perfect. Okay. Okay. You can Excellent. also hide the little bar down. You can also hide. Please, Maurizio, you have 40 minutes. And for the okay. audience, okay. Uh, we, you can do the questions when the speaker will ask you. Okay. We do not postpone the questions at the end of the session, but you can interact when uh, Maurizio will ask you uh, if you have questions. Okay. Please, Maurizio. Yeah, yeah I think it's better. Because this is very sad that I have in front of the screen talking by myself. So I think if I break it into pieces, it will be better. Also, after lunch or early in the morning for some people, it may be really bad. Okay, very good. So thank you very much, Giacomo. It's a great pleasure presenting my work. So the presentation is uh, inference of causal relationships from raw time series in fluid structure interaction problems. And uh, the general idea of the presentation will be to try together to understand a little bit about what happens during fish schooling. So I imagine many of you are familiar with the topic and uh, Many, many of you are not. Uh, all of you are likely fascinated by the beauty of uh, a schooling pattern. So when we talk about schooling, uh, we basically are uh, describing uh, um, a collective behavior in which uh, a group of animals, a group of fish, uh, is swimming uh, in a very polarized manner toward a given direction while maintaining a very precise uh, formation with respect to each other. So it looks like a crystal structure in which each of the animal is uh, maintaining a distance from their peers and they are all pointing toward the same direction. So why are they doing that? There are a bunch of reasons that have been proposed over the years. They may be searching for food in a more efficient way. They may protect better from a predator should they attack. More interestingly, especially for this particular audience, is the possibility of uh, selecting uh, this locomotory pattern for reducing energy expenditure for the group, whereby the entire group may be getting uh, some benefit as a whole in terms of how much energy they can save during swimming. So this very specific explanation is uh, at the basis of the classical Bayes theory, which dates back 50 years almost. So if you're interested, you, I highly recommend reading the paper. It's a beautiful paper, very short, but very dense of interesting results. And it has this beautiful picture, which is very self-explanatory in my opinion. So this is a typical pattern in which you would see kind of a diamond structure. So look at the diamond, which is or a rhombus. And the argument that Bayes makes entails uh, the structure of the vortex trail behind the fish. So if you take fish A, for example, what will happen is that fish B, by being in the middle 
of A and C is basically being pulled forward by the vortices which are generated by A and C. So you can see this vortex and this vortex, the way they spin, they are pulling this guy forward. If B was right here, then it would be the opposite effect. It would be, be it would be pushed backward. So by simply looking at this picture, one can propose that the way they organize themselves is somehow for benefiting the entire group, especially individuals which are in the back, that are interacting with the coherent structure which are shed by the living fish to gain some form of energy and therefore reduce their cost of swimming. So this is a very classical theory, well developed, this textbook material. However, even today we are doing experiments, try to validate this theory and understand better what's going on. Uh, in the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, uh, there has been a, a major advancement in our ability to do experiments with animals. And as a result, uh, there have been uh, a lot of traction in doing uh, very methodologically oriented experiments that can help us understand better how a fish would interact uh, with coherent structures, similar to those uh, that would come from the vortex trail of a fish leading the group. So there is beautiful work uh, by Jimmy Liao and uh, published over the years where uh, he has been looking uh, at uh, fish swimming in the <coughs> wake of uh, a blunt body. So you have uh, alpha cylinder, a flow coming from left to right, and you do have vorticity shedding. So there is this complex wake pattern. And he was able to observe how a fish engages with uh, this vorticity pattern and is able to somehow ride the wake and gain some hydrodynamic advantage by this form of interaction. Interestingly, you can also do experiments in which uh, you can precisely pinpoint at uh, the muscle that is activated by the interaction, which is very interesting, a very, very complex experiment. Overall, these studies have brought light into the explanation of vice and they help us understand the feasibility of hydrodynamic interactions underlying collective behavior. However, the story is not finished. What has happened over the years is that we have gathered uh, as a community technical results which are somehow questioning the explanation of the hydrodynamic advantage or at least warranting additional consideration of what's really happening. So a couple of papers which I think are uh, really illuminating on the complexity of the problem are a paper at NYU by Ristroff and Zhang in uh, 2008, which has shown something very interesting. That is uh, a phenomenon of inverse drafting. So if you take uh, a fake uh, school of fish in the form of a passive flag, which is uh, flapping in uh, due to an incoming uh, water current, what you would see is that it is possible to modulate the drag of the members of the school so that the fish in front may actually be the one gaining and the one in the back be the one suffering, which is not what you would expect looking at the entire group. Like what we've seen before, the fish in front should be the one who is getting a hit and the one in the back should be the one benefiting from it. So here with the inverse drafting, this theory is somehow questioned, and that's very interesting. Another part which is uh, very interesting is a recent experiment by Astraf and colleagues, where they basically have shown that uh, above a critical speed, the diamond pattern is broken in favor of a very different pattern that they call the phalanx. So in the phalanx, the fish, rather than uh, having uh, some this uh, diamond-like structure, they swim uh, like a Roman phalanx, all of them in uh, uh, parallel configuration with an incoming uh, velocity, with an incoming flow. And they tend to synchronize their uh, tail beating. So that explanation is unlikely to uh, fulfill 
a theory of hydrodynamic advantage based on riding the wake. There will be something else happening. So if we want to understand better what are the mechanisms underlying free schooling, we have a couple of options in the literature. One option is, uh, I think, what is most dear to this particular community is developing models, developing a mathematical model of fish swimming, and uh, that entails primarily looking at the fluid structure interaction. So try to understand how the locomotion, how the motion of the animal body determines the structure of the flow, and vice versa, how the flow structure is influencing the deformation of the body. There is uh, a lot of work happening in this domain, very, very important work. However, there is a key limitation of the studies, which is uh, that uh, it is very difficult with a simulation to capture muscle activities, as well as to capture the determinants of social behavior. So these simulations are excellent for uh, pursuing a deterministic approach based on fundamental laws in mechanics, but uh, as we try to elucidate animal behavior, we do have several challenges related to which muscles are activated, why they are activated, what are social determinants related to other mechanisms that may underline collective behavior. For example, the perception of a predator, a food source, so other mechanisms that are very difficult to control for when we run simulations. An alternative is to do experiments. We have done quite a few of them. They are very nice. I like them a lot. You basically can, uh, these days, uh, um, experiment uh, uh, on single fish swimming in a water channel by running particle image velocimetry. You can understand the flow structure in the vicinity of the fish. You can relate that to the motion of the body, trying to understand how the body deformation relates to the flow physics. You can even do something fancier. You can try to measure the oxygen intake by the animal. You can do electromyography. You can do many of these things, and you can learn quite a bit. How difficult are these experiments? They are very difficult. They are really uh, painful because uh, you are uh, trying to create this laser sheet. The animal has to go into the laser sheet. There are a bunch of technical challenges related to doing these experiments, right? And when you start to do this experiment with a group of fish, the complexity grows very much because you are asking all the fish to nicely behave, pass all of them along a laser sheet, and uh, be able to gather this data in a very consistent manner for a long time. So that's not easy at all. And then the manipulations are limited. So what we would like to do is pursue a different approach, which complements somehow these uh, ongoing efforts, but offer a different perspective to look at collective behavior in terms of uh, time series analysis. Also, we would like to borrow techniques from information theory, dynamical systems theory, and networks to shed light uh, on the principles of collective behavior. So specific questions that we would like to address are how these collective patterns emerge? Are fish all equal? Are some of them taking an, an active role versus others taking a passive role? Is individual difference is important? Also, what are the pathways of interaction? Is only flow? Do you have, what is the role of vision? Are they additive? What happens with them? Also, why fish opt for one pattern versus another one? Is the transition from a diamond to, uh, to a phalanx merely driven by hydrodynamic advantage, or there is something else going on? So these are questions that we would like to address through experimental research based on dynamical systems theory. So what I will be doing in this presentation is uh, trying to walk you through a few of our work in this topic. We will be starting uh, with uh, uh, our first study in JFM, where we have been looking uh, at, uh, uh, I would call them fake fish, uh, pitching airfoils. But I think it's pretty good uh, to lay the foundation for the study. Then uh, we will be touching uh, on uh, extension of the approach 
looking at uh, an alternative way for interpreting and visualizing the data set based on recurrence quantification. And finally, some preliminary results on fish swimming. So that will be the pathway of this presentation. All right. So the very first experiment that we did, and it was a lot of fun, was looking at a very simple water channel. So the water is coming left to right. We have two airfoils, airfoil U and D. U is the one upstream and D is the one downstream. What we do is we can control in this experiment the interdistance between the two airfoils. And what we can do is we can control which of the airfoil is actively pitching and which one is passively pitching. And what we would like to do is trying to understand if from simple row time series of the pitching angle of either of the airfoil, we are able to tell which one is the airfoil that we are controlling and which one is the airfoil that instead we are passively let interact with the active airfoil. So what we would like to do is develop a methodology for inferring, inferring cause and effect relationships underlying fluid structure interactions from simple motion data. So in principle, think of the fish again, I would be, I would like to pick up fish looking at their motion data and be able to tell which is the fish that is starting the motion, which are fish which are instead following by passively moving their body, understand what is the time scale of their interaction and what is the driving mechanism. So these are the questions I would like to address and I would like to address this question simply looking at motion data without inspecting the flow structure. All right, so if we think of the experiment, the experiment we did it in a very highly controlled, in a highly controlled manner. So what we did is uh, we have two experimental conditions. One is called upstream active and the other is downstream active. So in the upstream active, we are controlling actively the pitching of the airfoil upstream and letting the one downstream move passively. And then downstream active, we have the opposite scenario. So let's look. So uh, in the experiment, when we are actively controlling, what we are doing is we are implementing a Markov chain on the pitching angle of the airfoil so that at each time step, we will be tossing a coin and deciding whether to stay in the current configuration or flip into the other one. So you can see what happened is uh, when I am doing uh, the active control, I am going from minus uh, 15 degrees or so up to 15 degrees, and I am transitioning between them randomly. Uh, in response, uh, the passive airfoil is undergoing uh, a motion which is much smoother in response to the active airfoil. The opposite case, you have uh, that the downstream airfoil is actuated, again, following a stochastic pattern given by a Markov chain, and the upstream airfoil is passively responding to the motion of the one downstream. So the flow is somehow mediating the information transfer and is responsible for uh, activating the passive airfoil in response to the motion of the active airfoil that we control actively with a microcontroller. So here is a, a visualization with PID. So in the, up, in the upstream active case, you have that the one upstream is beating the shedding that index with the um, airfoil in the back, which will start pitching. Opposite case, we are instead activating the airfoil downstream. As the airfoil downstream starts pitching, the one upstream is responding. So experimentally, we have a very, very clear cause and effect relationship. We know what, what is the cause or what is the source, and we know what is the effect or the target. And now our job is to draw to infer 
which is the cause and effect, just looking at data. Okay, so the basic mathematical tool that we will be using to embark on this task is called transfer entropy. So I didn't invent transfer entropy. Transfer entropy was invented 20 years ago by Schreiber in a very classical and seminal piece of work where he has been looking at understanding information transfer between two coupled dynamical systems. It, the approach extends mutual information to be able to capture directional information transfer. So it's something very exciting, and since now it's pervasive to many, many domains in which we want to address questions regarding causality. So the basic tool underlying transfer entropy is the notion of entropy. So entropy is defined in an information theoretic sense as Shannon entropy. So mathematically, the entropy of a random variable is defined as the expectation of the logarithm of the distribution with a minus in front. So if you think of uh, the simplest example of all from Wikipedia, what you will see is that if I toss a coin, then if the tails and the heads have the same probability, then I have a lot of entropy, I have a lot of uncertainty, because there is very little I can do to predict the outcome of the experiment. If instead the heads or the tail have a higher probability, then I have uh, a biased uh, coin, and what will happen is that my ability to predict the outcome of the experiment will be much higher, and therefore the uncertainty or the entropy will be lower, if you see here. So, starting from one random variable, you can define entropy of a pair of variables as well as conditional entropy very, very simply. So the only difference is that you will be looking at a pair or you will be condition the two variables. So that's about it, very simple. So, and if you like, you can also relate the conditional entropy to this and this as the difference you will be doing. I'll show you what we have been diagram. Anyway, so these are the basic tools. Now, if we want to apply this to study causality in dynamical systems, we need to look at processes. So the definition of transfer entropy is very simple. What it does, it helps us quantify the reduction in the uncertainty for the prediction of one stochastic process from its past due to some additional knowledge about the past of another process. So the process X will be the cause and Y will be the effect. So let's look at it with a simple set. So I have Y of T is the process at time T. So H of Y of T is the entropy of the process at time T. So imagine the fish. This will be the uncertainty regarding the behavior of the fish. So part of this uncertainty can be explained utilizing the uncertainty at the previous step, right? And this is H of Yt minus 1. So this particular uh, uh, portion of the set is the conditional entropy. So this is uh, the entropy, the uncertainty of the process Y of T that you cannot explain utilizing its past. Great. Now, if I add another process, x of t minus 1, what will happen is that maybe I can capture some of this uncertainty through x of t minus 1. So if I do that, I will be saying that x of t minus 1 is encoding some of the uncertainty, some of the information of yt, and therefore it can be causal to y of t. So let's look at it. So you can see this one is h of yt conditioned to both the variables, both the past. This is h of yt conditioned to yt minus 1. And what is left now is what we call transfer entropy. So transfer entropy is measuring the uh, entropy of the present state of yt that is not captured by its past, but is in fact captured by the past of x of t. So in the formulas, you can write transfer entropy as the conditional entropy, yt, yt minus 1, minus 
y t, y t minus 1, x t minus 1. So this is transfer entropy. This quantity is by construction non-negative. If this quantity is zero, the variable x does not have any predictive value on y. Whereas if this variable is greater than zero, we will be speaking of a causal relationship where X plays the role of the cause and Y plays the role of the effect. Beautiful. Now, how do we tackle our problem of fluid structure interaction? Very well. What, what we do is uh, we, first of all, symbolize the time series. The reason for symbolizing is to be able to work with a reduced data set which is quite handy, it's a very nice thing, and it simplifies a lot the problem of estimating a probability density function from experimental data. So what we do is we utilize only two symbols, pi one and pi two, to <coughs> say if the airfoil is <coughs> increasing the pitching angle or decreasing the pitching angle, either if it is upstream or downstream. So this, this uh, complex time series is at the end, symbolized into a Boolean time series for either ut or dt. So you have two symbols going decreasing or increasing. Very simple. So then the computation of transfer entropy is super simple because all these variables are Boolean. They can take a value minus one or one. So you can do it very simply. Keep in mind that on the left, this part that is flat, it's really not flat because it's experimental data. So there is experimental uncertainty. We are tracking the data. So what happens is that when you are here, you will be seeing uh, oscillation. And sometimes you catch a, uh, a symbol one or sometimes you symbol uh, pi two. So that's not a big deal. It's just uncertainty. We are all good. All right. Oh, one more thing, very important. In general, rather than looking at uh, just a single time step in the past, we like to go back delta time step. Going back delta time step is very important because it can help us understand the physical mechanism underlying the interaction. We can say what is the time scale determining the interaction between the two airfoils. Okay, very good. So the first thing that we did, we did a semi-synthetic experiment in which we have both the airfoils actively controlled, specifically the airfoil leading is moving according to a Markov chain, and the one in downstream is moving, simply copying the one upstream with a little bit of uncertainty. So we had a probability that sometimes it messes it up. So what do you observe? You observe something super clean and robust. So what you have is that transfer entropy here, we measure it in bits because we have logarithm base two is very high, so red color, when we go upstream to downstream, because this is the direction of information transfer. On the other end, if we measure transfer entropy downstream to upstream, we have a very small value, 100 times less. Why? Because the airfoil that is downstream is not the cause of the one that is upstream is vice versa. We are indeed making sure that the one downstream is copying the one upstream. What else? Oh, well, we have that if you do the experiment by independently controlling the two of them, you get two small transfer entropy values and neither of them is large enough to reach significance. If you now look at the delay, what we have is that uh, the transfer entropy is maximized when we are selecting a value of the delay that corresponds to the real delay we are using in copying the information. So not only we are able to tell what is the cause and what is the effect, but also we are able to tell how much time it takes for information to propagate from one airfoil to another airfoil due to the fluid medium. So now going to the real experiments, you have that when we do upstream active, meaning that the airfoil upstream is the one that is driving and the one in the back is the one passive, you have very clear information transfer from upstream to downstream. So here red, here blue, so very clear. 
Vice versa, when the one downstream is active, you have the transfer entropy values are much bigger than the transfer entropy value in the other direction. So the technique works very well. We can pick up really nicely the cause and effect relationship. In addition to that, we can also pick up a delay, a time delay of the interaction that is very much illuminating the physics of the problem. So what we observe is that increasing the interdistance between the two airfoils, so L is the distance and C is the chord length, we observe that the delay that we are picking up through transfer entropy is increasing when we are looking at upstream active. And the reason is that the vortex take more time to reach from the trailing edge of from the, the uh, upstream airfoil to the downstream airfoil, whereas the time scale of the interaction is not affected by the interdistance when we are activating the airfoil in the back. In this case, in fact, it is tenable that the interaction is mediated by surface waves that goes much faster. So there is no reason why you should observe an increase in the time of interaction as we, you bring them apart. Okay. So I would like to stop a couple of minutes and discuss this a little bit, Giacomo, and then I'll go to the rest of the talk that is bringing another tool to learn about this class of fluid structure interaction. Yes, of, of course. Are there any questions from the audience uh, at the moment? Curiosities, comments? I was, cu I was curious about the, the experiment you performed with the airfoil. Mm -hmm. so, uh, did, did you, uh, does it matter how how uh, broad the channel is used or how oh, i didn't hear but the width of the channel so so not the distance from airfoil to airfoil but the, the from from airfoil to boundary does it matter or uh, my short answer is that we did not control for it i do expect it to play a role especially when we are looking at downstream active which, because my uh, expectation is that when we are activating this guy and not this guy, most of the interaction will go with surface waves and pressure waves. So in that case, the interaction with the lateral wall should play an important role. But it was not a parameter we buried in the experiment. Okay, but thank I you. I you that it should be important. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for the answer. Yeah. Yep. And we will see actually this effect uh, much cleaner when we look at the fish, because the fish is not fooled. And what happens is that he sees this wall and he starts messing with the walls. So the walls are important. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a question as well. Please, when please, Alex. Both, yeah. When, when you're controlling both of the, the airfoils, right, yes. then they're clearly correlated. But you said you also get causality out of it, which I get, you know, if you're controlling both of them at the same time, that there is no actual causality, right? That there's just correlation. So how do you get causality out of that? Oh, okay, very good. So what we specifically do is the following. What we do is uh, I activate one of them. And then the other one, I am not exactly copying. I am every, at every time step, I am superimposing a Bernoulli process. And what I do, I decide whether I shall copy or I should do the opposite. So there is uncertainty added with respect to the downstream airfoil. And on top of it, I prescribe a given time delay at which this copying process is actuated. And given that my transfer entropy computation always go from backward in time to forward in time, systematically, I pick up one direction of causality because time is only going forward. Does it answer? Yes, thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, okay. can I ask thank a question? You. So this is Bastien speaking for Yes, you. yes, of course. So yes. We are working on, on similar ideas, but in a very different different context. It's uh, more in the in the process of controlling a dynamical system, which of course you want to find the cause to control the effect. So it's uh, in control theory. And uh, something that is interest, uh, interesting for us is what we call the control length, is to which distance can we have a significant impact? 
So I assume that in your case, it would be by moving, uh, increasing the L between the airfoil. Mm -hmm. And what we observe is that this uh, transfer entropy, it decreases exponentially in the system we have, which is not the same as yours. So it means that uh, the, the further away you are, uh, the less easy you control and it, it drops exponentially. And so we define this, okay. this control length. And I was wondering if you have something similar. Yeah, very cool, very cool. We got this, I think it's very much in line with what you see here. Okay. So if you look at this, um, we have the from upstream to da from upstream to downstream. You can see that we start from deep red and we get to this pale pink. Mm -hmm. So the the extent of the transfer is indeed decreasing as you increase the distance between them. Yeah. And how, how does it uh, decrease? Or do you, do you have a a formula? Yeah. For no, I, I don't have a formula. Yeah, just just so if I, just yeah, experimental yeah. data, we have no model. Is there a characteristic length? Like you know, if it drops exponentially, you can you can find the the, the, the half uh, amplitude, you know, the length for for dropping by one half or something like that. So you, you could add some characteristic length. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, mean, I didn't look at it. We can look at it. Well, we can look at it together with the data, but we didn't look uh, at. Uh, I I'm not sure if this how it scales actually. Because it also depends how we define it. Because what happens is that the one on top is dropping, but also the one on the bottom. Is so you have that the extent of the information is less, but then the net transfer entropy, which is the difference between the two, it may change differently. So we need to look at the data to give you a good answer. What we did for this type of correlation, we looked or uh, the time delay between them. So there we have cleaner results. But for the magnitude, I don't have it uh, on top yeah. of my head. We can look at it together if you like. Yeah, OK, thanks. You're very welcome. OK, thanks. We can keep on uh, the speech. Yes. And uh, please, Mauricio, you have 10 minutes left. Yes, yes, okay. yes. I, I, I'll pull it okay. through. OK, very good. All right. So thanks very much. Yes. So the next piece um, uh, that I wanted to talk about, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll go fast, but I think it's kind of neat. Uh, and for and since in the audience there are dynamical systems people, this is a very standard technique, but maybe for, for others it's a standard. So I think it's nice to spend a couple of words. So another way we can look at systems is looking at them, not in terms of time series, but in terms of uh, recurrence plots. So recurrence uh, quantification dates back uh, more than 30 years, and it's a very elegant technique uh, to um, quantify important features of dynamical systems. And the idea is uh, very nicely explained by picking a simple example that can be a Lorentz system. So imagine the following. So these are X, Y, and Z for your Lorentz system on the left. So what we do is uh, rather than looking at the time series, we will be doing a plot in which we put one time and the other time we will be coloring uh, this uh, plot with white or black points as we are getting recurrence. So a black point means that point time t and tau are within the same ball. So let's look at it. So imagine we want, we are, uh, take time 17, so we are here. So what we are doing, we are coloring in black all the other times at which the trajectory of the dynamical system is in the ball yellow, which is not many times. You can see that the, the trajectory is sparse here. If instead you look here, which is at time two or three, you have uh, that uh, uh, the trajectory is very dense in the vicinity of this point, and therefore you have many black points. So what you can do out of a recurrence plot, you can quantify the length of diagonal lines, the length of horizontal lines, and even you, which are measure of determinism. You can look at periodic structure. You can even quantify the amount of exponents of the dynamical system. So by drawing the time series in terms of a recurrence plot, you can bring a lot of nice features of the dynamical system in a way that is very transparent. So what we have done, we have taken this tool, extended it to the concept of symbolic recurrence plot. And on top of the symbolic recurrence quantification, we have created a probability space on which we can compute transfer entropy. 
so that we can get results which are expressed rather than as time series, they are expressed as recurrence plot. And we are able to get a nicer prediction with less data. So let's look at it. So the main tweak with respect to standard recurrence quantification is the idea of using symbols. So what we will be doing is we will be saying that uh, we have recurrence if we are getting the same symbol. Now, this seems a very incremental change, but in reality is a big deal because if you are saying that you are recurring on a symbol, then you can color your uh, recurrence plot and not only your black and white that will be recurrence or not recurrence, but you can also specify to which state the system is recurring. So you can get information also about the dynamic behavior of the system from the recurrence plot. So it's really going from black and white TV to go to color TV. Once you have a color TV, you can start answering questions regarding the information content of this particular plot. And based on the definition of an entropy as a uh, uncertainty in the color that you pick up, we can define transfer entropy. And that's a very elegant result that we can use for um, causality analysis. So, going to the example of the upstream uh, airfoil and the downstream airfoil, we can just look at the upstream active case. So, what you can observe is uh, if we just look at binary symbols, we have that red is increasing and blue is decreasing. So, what you observe is you observe a highly structured data set you observe that the downstream airfoil is showing wider bands because it's responding to the upstream airfoil. Then you can also generate what we call a joint recurrence plot. The joint recurrence plot is showing four different colors because we have the combination of the two airfoils. Out of the recurrence plot of the joint airfoils, you can see that we do have a lot of green and a lot of red, more than anything else. What does the red and green mean? The red and green mean the alternating pattern, this and this. So out of the recurrence plot, we are able to tell that there is this form of interaction in which the upstream airfoil is pitching and the other is pitching in the opposite direction. So which is the basic physical principle we were missing earlier. So you have a very elegant visualization of the interaction between the airfoils. And based on this visualization, you can also compute transfer entropy. The main uh, element to define transfer entropy is to define a probability space. That's the main contribution of our work is to construct a probability space on this recurrence plot upon which we can compute transfer entropy. After you have uh, tuned your transfer entropy analysis, we can perform an equivalent study and be able to pick up the correct direction of causality between the two airfoils. So in this case, we observe that for uh, uh, the upstream active case, we are able to experimentally measure a value of transfer entropy, which is far away into the tail of a synthetic distribution, which we cannot do once we look at uh, the transfer entropy from downstream to upstream. So that's another tool that I wanted to put forward for experimenting on time series and be able to look at causal relationship underlying fluid structure interactions. The last thing, and then I think I'm good with time, is taking on the problem of uh, the live fish. So what we have done is we have modified our experimental setup and we have replaced the second airfoil with a live animal, which is over here. The size of the live animal is comparable to the size of the airfoil. We are looking at five to seven centimeters for a giant denio. And again, we are using the same theoretical apparatus to look at uh, the response of the animal to the airfoil. So here how the experiment looks like. You have this pitching airfoil and the uh, animal is swimming in the back. One key difference that I must mention, it's a little technical, but I think it's important, is that uh, for, the, for this experiment, we have that the airfoil is not alternating between two states, jumping back and forth, that will be very unnatural for the animal. But what we are doing is we are uh, um, 
oscillating the airfoil at three possible frequencies, which we call low, medium, and high. And then we have a Markov chain that is alternating, that is telling us which frequency value to pick for 10 consecutive cycles. What we do is we do experiment at four different flow speeds, and we tune the selection of the frequency to each particular flow speed. The reason is that the animal will naturally beat its tail at a different frequency depending on the incoming speed. So at the highest speed, the animal is on average going at uh, four tail beat per second, and therefore we are picking that four hertz as the frequency of the central frequency of the airfoil. And then what we do is we look at the time series of the airfoil and the time series of the fish. So for the airfoil, you can see that we have 10 consecutive cycle, then Markov change can change the state, another 10, and then another 10. Experimentally, we measure the average frequency here, which will be 12, 226, for example, 366 and 3, which are the red points that you see over here. The fish is responding as well, and what we do is we partition in uh, equivalent uh, segments and we compute the frequency of each of the segments. And we perform our transfer entropy analysis on the time series of the frequencies and the other time series of the frequency. So in this way, we are trying to capture if the animal is changing its tail bit frequency as a function of the tail bit frequency of the airfoil upstream. So we do have experiments in which we can correlate where is the fish as a function of the flow field. And here we go back to the question of our colleague before. Here the walls, I believe, play a big role. You can see the role of the walls here. But more interestingly, you can see that the fish is interacting with the wall, in particular at a large flow speed, where we start seeing that the animal tends to spend a lot of time in the corners here, the two corners. So when we start looking at uh, um, transfer entropy data, what we observe is that uh, the highest influence of the airfoil is observed at uh, the lowest speed of the water, which is zero placid water. So in this case, we have that the fish is responding the most to the airfoil. As the speed increasing, the interaction is decreased, likely because uh, the airfoil is not contributing any form of hydrodynamic advantage, and the fish needs instead to swim against the flow, and he wants to do it in a way that saves energy for the animal. So, in conclusion, we presented a methodology to look at uh, fluid structure interaction from row time series, trying to uncover potential cause and effect relationship, recurrence analysis, and we are starting now to work uh, on experimental data of animals. We have a few studies going on, and I hope we'll be able to report more conclusions on looking at groups of animals. Uh, I am very excited and interested to study this. It's, I think it's amazing. So this video, I think, is really incredible. At low speed, the transition from this kind of formation to this other kind of formation. So to understand how information is, change, is exchanged here. So I do expect that the information transfer here is much faster, similar to what we see from the downstream to the upstream. Likely, there, is a, there are other mechanisms than vorticity shedding, which are underpinning the interaction between the animals. So I am keen on doing experiments, recreating uh, these uh, particular results, and be able to do the analysis that we, on transfer entropy to understand information transfer. And uh, I would like to thank my collaborators. So the first work was with Sean and Peng. Then uh, Manolo is uh, uh, my host here during my sabbatical. We worked with him on a lot of problems in uh, transfer entropy analysis, and uh, uh, Alain and Mert, they have been working with us in translating this concept into the study of fluid structure interactions. And with this, I conclude. I have to thank NSF that is uh, generously funding our work. And we have this new grant that is really, really about understanding uh, the mechanisms of uh, hydrodynamic uh, advantage underlying fish schooling that just started. And hopefully, we'll get something nice out of it.
So thank you, Giacomo. That's all I have, and I hope I was pretty good on time. Giacomo. Giacomo. Giacomo, we cannot hear you. Giacomo. I, I fear that, but you can, can you please talk to me? So, <laughs> so the, the, the connection didn't break, right? So no, I, I was no, talking perfect. to you, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, good, good, yeah, good. yeah, probably. Okay, good, 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 good. So any comments, questions, suggestions? Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, okay, I think that yeah. I was back online. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just a yeah. very quick question because we are already out of the schedule. Sorry, Alex, but a very quick question, please. Okay. Okay, so my, my very short question is when you pick the frequency uh, for the fish experiment, it looked like the average frequency of the fish was a little bit higher than that of your, uh, of the one that you actually used for the uh, snapping wings. Is there a reason for that? Ah. Uh. So that one is uh, something uh, which uh, came a little unexpected because when we did the pilot experiments, the fish uh, were swimming in the range uh, that I used for uh, designing the, the teaching uh, frequency of the airfoil. When we did the experiment, the fish started swimming faster. Maybe it is because we were looking at two different groups of animals for the pilot and for the second group, and that didn't help. But you're perfectly right. These guys are, uh, are uh, so this is about three, this is higher. It's about three, almost four. Yeah, and you're perfectly right. Okay, okay. Well, thank you. You can never control the fish well. Uh, okay. Yeah, they are what they are. <laughs> You, you must tell the fish to to behave, uh, Mauricio. Okay. Yeah. No, they but the issue, because the issue is that you keep buying them and the size cut because there is an effect of size and there is a little bit of variation of on the size. Yeah. Okay. okay. So thanks. Let's thanks Mauricio one more time and uh, really thank you very much for this uh, truly inspiring uh, uh, talk. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. So let's move to the other uh, speaker.